Um, I, you know both of them, I imagine, so we're going to go a little bit in order. But Chris Boardman, aside from being the commissioner and being such a champion for British cycling, um, also, as you might be aware, is one of the champions with Dave Brailsford of marginal gains, that idea of every little bit counts. And maybe look outside. You had a great quote about um, game-changing ideas come from people who haven't got a clue and ask stupid questions, which sound, it's not dismissive, is it? I remember the stupid questions one, but yeah. uh, I'm all over that. It one. was the 42 <laughs> centimeter bar. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that the idea being that sometimes your ideas um, will come from outside your sphere, obviously, which is great. I'd love to get into that later. Um, and also maybe from outside your population. I'm delighted to be here, but this is a pretty homogenous audience. So I would suggest to you that one of the best things you could possibly do is to diversify in every way your audience and get people in because people of color, people who don't have much money are probably most likely to be walking because they have to. Get them on side, their families, their people who can count. Um, Will, we talked last night and I embarrassed the hell out of him by saying, you're going to be at my table of interesting people, um, which he said, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, the conversation. yeah, yeah, then, yeah then we talked about, no, he's not. But um, I mean, having worked at Nike, having worked at think tanks, done research, been in private sector, I think both of you, the fact that you've been brought in by your respective governments, regional governments, says a lot about the importance that they're placing on this issue, that they brought people of such profile and knowledge into this piece of work. And now the question is, of course, what are you going to do with that? So Chris, to you first, what are your vision and priorities? Well, uh, quite poignantly, what I brought is complete ignorance of uh, of local government uh, planning, road structures, all of those elements. That's about what I hope I brought with some curiosity um, and some common sense, um, which which is often very hard when you get mired in the detail. Um, last week I was walking around Appledore and working on the national on the World Track Cycling Championships. Um, so every day I walked into the uh, into the velodrome. It's about an hour's walk across the town, and it was depressing. It was so depressing that this is 600 miles away and it's done. And if you took anybody from uh, the UK and stood them in any of these streets, they'd go, yeah, I prefer this, this is great. Um, and so we can see it, it is done, it's done at a scale and we know that 50% of kids ride, um, ride to school every day and, um, and, and we haven't done it, you know. Um, and I think um, for me, I actually asked when Andy Burnham phoned me up, I asked for the walking brief. They asked me to be cycling commissioner because they should be and are natural partners. They are active travel, which is, it polarizes opinion, that particular phrase, but I, I like it because it's suitably ambiguous or it's ambiguous enough, but if you went on the street and said to somebody, what's active travel? They'd say cycling and walking. So it, it's enough that it doesn't tribalize, because that's the beauty of walking is nobody is offended by walking. You know, cycling tribalizes people. Um, and so if you can bundle these things together, then you have active travel and everybody can relate to it to it better. But it's not so ambiguous that you can't be held to account. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what I wanted to share, if that's okay, is just sort of four things that I've observed as I've come along with my big bag of ignorance. And just, I went around for a few months and just asked questions and, and tried to, to learn about what was already there. I think uh, number one was, was that the thing that we haven't done well is we haven't made it compelling. We haven't made it something that you look out of your car window and go, oh, I quite fancy that. And we focused on the facts and the health and the congestion, the pollution, and all these things that are important. But that's not how we make decisions. We make it on what is the easiest thing for me right now. Even if I know it's going to be to my own detriment, I, I don't make logical decisions. I do easy things. I walked across Appledore and I walked across London today to get here because it was actually the easiest thing for me to do. Um, and all those other things are nice and they're important and they, they have a place when discussing it at a governmental level. But ultimately, if you want to change behaviours, which is what we're talking about, we have to take a leaf out of the car industry uh, book. I, I, I mentioned to somebody a few weeks ago during the course of, uh, of conveying this message in Manchester, the, the Trafford Centre, an enormous shopping centre, very difficult to get there any other way than by car. Because we, we talk about people in activity and they don't like exercise and nobody, nobody wants to and they don't think of it in that way. But you can get people to walk a long way. And I, I went on Google Earth and I measured it and I found that it was on average about 800 metres from your car to get to the centre. And then the centre was one, 
783 metres long. So I worked, if you did two floors, ambled along, wandered about a bit back to your car, you've done over four kilometres without even thinking of calling it walking. So people are not averse, and they don't make those spaces look like that for fun. You know, this is, there's no benevolence here. They make it because they know that's what they need to do to get you there. It's comfortable, the space to push a double buggy, there is, uh, there's places, there's things to look at, a place to stop for a coffee, all the things that will get you to do it. And we need to focus on that now, that we have to make it appealing. So trees, and all that. you've already found a lot of this stuff, and it's already in train, I realise that. And the fact that I'm repeating a lot of it is good, it's a triangulation that says these are the things that we need to work on. So uh, walking for me is a natural partner for, for riding bikes, and it's also a less divisive way to actually get the whole active travel package bought into. We're, we're going to change how we measure street successfulness, and again, this is happening in London how we actually measure what is a successful street. So when we arrived in Manchester, it is we, we, we measure traffic, traffic movement, we don't measure people movement, and we don't measure how people feel about this place. So we're going to change how we measure what is a successful street, how we measure success. And to get agreement to do these things, I've already had a small experience, is we get agreement step by step away from the heated battle. So I produced a 15 step report of all the things we need to do to get meaningful modal shift. And it was presented as a report, not a strategy that they go, oh, okay, before we sign this, we're really gonna have the details and we'd still be doing it now. It was a report, okay, it's a report. I don't have to do this, okay, let's talk. And then you can have an open conversation. And then that went to um, all of the leaders in December and it was adopted unanimously, so it effectively became our strategy but in a way that it was okay. Um, other standards I would like to see, consultations, and I have been watching from a distance in London, gave some evidence at the assembly a few weeks ago, where we have between 60 and 90% support for a scheme, but nobody's decided beforehand what is enough. So there's always this, oh, are we gonna do it? We're not. Well, decide beforehand away from the heat of battle. And this might be me being a little naive, but I'm gonna try it on. Um, Decide beforehand what would be enough. What, would, what is the go, no-go point that we think, okay, we're, we're going to tell people in advance, if we get this much support, we're going to go ahead with it. Um, and standards, where, you know, we, again, away from the heat of battle, if you want to get modal shift, then you've got to decide, uh, you design your space, and we will only fund space that uh, you, can, you can push, a parent can push a double buggy, and want to push a double buggy around this space. It's a pleasant thing to do, and there's not cars parked on the pavement blocking it. It's a nice alternative. Uh, and, and for cycling, we have the 12 year old test. You know, you could be used by a competent 12 year old and want to be used by them, and more importantly, their parents would lend them. So, all these standards, I would like to do them away from each step at a time because they're logical and you can present them well um, and get them adopted before we actually get to the point where, right, we're in the road now, oh, I can't do it that way. Well, actually, we agreed these standards and we agreed these were the funding triggers. And so taking people step by step and, and giving them comfort to do it. Um, I think the last one for me is, is, is important to, in my case and the MERS case, is, is park our egos and make sure credit goes where it's due. So my team, and some of them are dotted about uh, the room here, we've got Martin Key, Jenny Wiles over there, um, Jenny keeps me on track with walking. Brian Deegan, who's our infrastructure expert, um, is, is in the room somewhere. That they work for each district, and they they don't tell them what to do. They don't come with ideas. They come listening, and they see what's needed to help. So, and when when we actually get to the other end, the district gets all of the the credit for it. All the people, the key opinion leaders that need that to get support themselves. And branding, although we'd all love to have a standard brand, the people in that area need to own it. You've got your Waltham Forest, your, your Enfields, they, they feel proud about the work that they've done uh, and they need to own it and that helps us all get it through. I've talked quite a long time now, haven't I? I'll stop now. Well, you could, you, you've done Will's bit. So you there we go. Do, yeah. Yeah, you've done. <laughs> Um, that was brilliant. Thank you. I mean, really good practical ideas as well as some inspiration. I thought, great way to get started. Thank you very much. Will, 
I'm going to echo something uh, that Chris said, is that I would not have taken this job if it was just cycling. The walking and cycling piece is what makes this so exciting. And I think one of the problems has been that walking has been so undervalued. It's been so off the agenda for, for so long. And I think it's testament to living streets and all the work that everybody's put into this that both Chris and I have walking in our in our job titles. The Rupert's just presented the, the the new strategy from central government that is walking and cycling, and we are seeing a significant shift that walking is being valued. I think it's it, it it isn't pedestrian. It has to be made more sexy. It has to be made more of a of a of, of a relevance and that emotive piece for for how we can get that shift. Last year, I'm delighted. This is the second year I've been to um, to, to Living Streets Walking Summit, and, and last year we discussed a lot of the benefits that that Keith touched on in terms of the mental and physical health benefits, the the benefits that it brings to communities in terms of social cohesion and, and tackling isolation, and, and so many of the social policy challenges that we are that we're facing, as well as creating those sort of vibrant economic communities that w that we need to have, and, and the role that walking can play in in rejuvenating the high streets. Uh, across the country. Um, but so, so from a London journey, I think where we've got from is, is so rather than just talking about the benefits, how does this actually get embedded in the way that London operates and it works? And I'm delighted that the mayor's taken this so seriously. It's at the very heart of our transport strategy is driving this modal shift from car usage to walking, cycling and public transport, which is again, like Chris, that active travel uh, push. And, and people know what, what that means in terms of everyday life. I think at the moment, 64% of all journeys in London are done by walking, cycling and public transport. What we want to see is that to get to 80%. Now that's a radical shift away from the car to those active, uh, active, um, to those active policies, making it sort of greener, healthier and cleaner for people to get, get around the city. Um, that transport strategy has been endorsed. It's been endorsed by the Assembly. I know Chris was there a couple of weeks ago. I was there and the Mayor was there last week. And, and that's got buy-in from a, across the board. Um, to follow that, I suppose it's then what are we actually going to do to drive and get those targets realised? We've got it embedded in policy. We've got it mainstream. How do we actually drive that change forward? And uh, I think that's where strategies begin to stop and the plans begin to start. How are we actually going to drive that? What's the budget behind it? And so in the coming months, TfL will be releasing the sort of how we're going to achieve that. But I want to sort of give a bit of a sneak preview in terms of how we want to draw, uh, achieve that ambition for, for London and, and going forward. Now, I'm going to speak very selfishly. What I want for London is London to be recognised as the world's most walkable global city. You know, it, it, is, it, is, it is such a walkable city at the moment. I think Terry uh, touched on, on some of this uh, earlier on when he was talking about his figures. But six and a half million journeys every day are done in London by walking. Six and a half million whole journeys. 29 million stages of journeys are done by walking in London. So that's walking to the bus, walking to the tube, walking to um, part, you know, other trams, where all the other different modes of modes of transport. But the sad thing is, there's so much more potential to do more. There's 3.3 million journeys that are currently done by car that could be walked very easily uh, across across the whole city. And to realise that potential, we need to be thinking about London as not just a single city. There are different areas and there are different zones to London. Central, everybody who knows central London, while the city, as, uh, as Keith said, is different in the weekend to the, to, the, to the week. But if anyone's around here during the week, you'll recognise the overcrowded pavements. You'll recognise the congested public transport. You'll recognise the clutter of private hire vehicles that take up our city. We need to tackle that in the central London, in the central city. In inner London, we've got other challenges. How do we make the high streets more walkable? How do we make those transport interchanges? And then out to London, the Ealings, the, the Bexleys, the, the, the Bromleys, the Harrows, we've got town centres. And we're not talking about getting people walking or cycling from from Dagenham to Hounslow across the whole city. It's how do you gear that into everyday life? How can you make those journeys to the shops, to the, to the, to the tube, to, the, uh, to visit a friend, to go to the hairdressers, to go to the doctors, more pleasant for, for walking? So what we really need to do is be thinking about how do we get people who aren't walking, of which there are a lot, walking, and how do we get those people who are walking to be walking more? So we've got to have that regional strategy, and there's money behind that. The, the Healthy Streets agenda that we're putting has got, got £2.2 .2 billion over five years to, to invest in changing the nature of our streets, making them more to do with people rather than to, to do with cars. Um, but, but there's also strategies on how we do that in terms of neighbourhoods. 
But there are some pan-London challenges that you will all be well aware of and that we need to take more seriously. Safety is absolutely paramount. It's depressing and alarming that the number of fatalities of pedestrians are, is, is, is suddenly started increasing again in, in the city. We have to tackle that. It is unacceptable that anyone walking or cycling or any deaths on the road are unacceptable, and we need to tackle that. We're, we're bringing out an approach which we're calling Vision Zero. We need more action on this, on how do we get, how do we reverse that trend and bring it down so that nobody is getting killed and seriously injured on our streets. And pedestrians and cyclists are the most vulnerable on those issues. We have to focus on them uh, as opposed to the other modes of transport. Somebody touched on another issue that is both true in Manchester and I was up there visiting my sister uh, last week and across all of London. We have to put accessibility and fairness at the very heart of the, at the very heart of this. That it is not fair that if someone is 80 who's losing their confidence or mobility is therefore trapped in their own homes or trapped in their neighbourhood because the state of the pavements or the crossings are not uh, are, are, are inhibiting and 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 stop people from actually getting out and getting all the benefits that we all know that that brings. We have to make sure that people can get around our city depending on what age, what ability, whether it's visual impairment and making sure that we're consistent on that. And one of the things we're going to be doing in London in the, in the coming months is releasing standard design guidance for all our schemes so that just as we've done with cycling, there's guidance on what makes good design and what makes good streets apes on that. We will have that for pedestrians rather than just for cyclists. Um, and... There's also, it's all great having this infrastructure, but you need to be able to find, find your way around. You know, there are, there is legible London as 10 years old, so the signs that go up around London, that's had a, that's a huge impact. But we need to be thinking about the next generation of that. Everybody these days has a map in their, in their pockets. I think 57% of Londoners use Google Maps to get around the city. We have to improve that. The algorithms they use are based on cars. So that puts people down the busiest, most polluted, most unpleasant roads. Actually, we need to be able to be working with the tech companies, providing them with the data to actually provide the, 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 the peeling routes, to make it more attractive, to make it easier, and to build that into people's ev everyday lives. The mayor is leading the charge on this. The, the, every time I speak to Sadiq, he's always pushing me, what are we doing here, what are we doing here, what are we doing here? But this is, as Chris pointed out, this is a behavior change issue. This is changing the culture. We've had decades of billions and billions of pounds being invested into the marketing of the car that's marketed the car as the right to freedom. You know, this is, this is a symbol of freedom. Everybody has, and, 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 and the culture and behavior has followed that. We need to redress that. We need to change that. But we need to work together to drive that systems change. It's absolutely critical that businesses are on board with this. It's not just coming from government. It's not just coming from the likes of me or Chris or Keith or Rupert or any of the other people. And it needs to have that business engagement. And I'm delighted to say how much support there is. The work that's been going on within the city has had such big support from local businesses and the, and the business community. I know the banks, uh, the bank transformation has been very powerfully backed by businesses. I know there are calls to do bits in other city and the bids, the business improvement districts that have been brought in. And I think Joe is in the room who has had something to do with that. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of the past is really pushing that in terms of our plans for Oxford Street, the businesses are behind that. The businesses are coming up with new ideas in terms of the Camden, Camden High Line, which is a great proposal of using unused, um, uh, disused railway to, from King's Cross to Camden to make a walkable High Line. Now, that's an exciting option which the business are putting forward. But it's government, business and communities, and the role that Living Streets and your members play is absolutely essential. Chris and I would not have walking in our job titles if it was not for the campaigning work that Living Streets and all your members have been doing. You have put, helped put walking on the map. You have put uh, walking at the very heart of our transport policies. But it's not just, that's not just enough. Getting a, a word in a job title and getting a position, getting the two of us sitting on a stage is not enough to drive the change. It's the continued work that you're doing. I, I point to a couple of examples of how important that is. Jeremy Leach, is he in the room? I'm sure he is. Jeremy, give us a wave. Um, the work that Jeremy and London Living Streets have been doing on the Walk Elephant campaign, of where communities have been working with businesses and government to drive a strategy to improve walking facilities in one area in London, has been really inspiring and certainly something that I've been promoting to other boroughs to take on board and to learn from that example, echo it and copy it across, across the loop. Similarly, I was approached by Mike. Is Mike and Alistair in the room? Um, I can see Mike here. Mike, give us a wave. So Mike and Alistair came to us 
at TfL to talk about crossings and, and how do we put better pedestrian priority into crossings in London. Now there's 6,000 crossings uh, in, in London uh, and we are undertaking a review of the timings of those crossings. With the new transport strategy, how do we begin to prioritise pedestrians more in the crossings? Now we know that as for older people, timing across the crossings is absolutely <coughs> critical. How do we use new technologies? There's a, a technology called Scoot, which I can never remember what Scoot stands for. Brian, what does Scoot stand for? Thank you very much. But essentially that means that uh, where there are cyclists, for example, the, the, it gives greater priority to the higher number of cyclists. We've got that for pedestrians in sites across London. There are a number of new technologies that we can use to make it safer uh, uh, across the city. And we want to be working with Living Streets and all of yourselves to, to, to keep pushing that together. I'm really confident that having this at the heart of a transport strategy, having the leadership of the mayor, having leadership of the business community, and having communities engaging in this conversation and, and the changes in a way that, has, that hasn't happened before, both here in Manchester and in cities across the whole of the UK, um, we will see the lasting change, but we need to keep doing this together. Keep pushing us, but also provide us with the support to drive the changes through when we need it. Thank you. Wow, brilliant stuff. Um, I particularly love the fact that you're both highly ambitious for your cities, but you're both also talking, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, about actions. How do you drive that into action? You're citing examples which people can take away from either London, Manchester, or wherever you're coming from in the audience. Really, really useful stuff. For anyone tweeting, I think you got the wireless stuff. It's, it's G Hall Events, Events 2018. Just in case, it's Chris underscore Boardman, because the other Chris Boardman's probably getting a lot of tweets today. Oh, he loves it. He, loves it. <laughs> he does. He apologizes. He keeps saying, I'm not that Chris Boardman. But anyway, um, I, I think in, in the face of all that ambition, perhaps one of the things the whole group might push you on is, um, what are the challenges you face and how specifically are you competing with those big drivers in, in the city of housing, affordable housing, development, we have to build more, I mean that's the one we see here all the time. Um, it, how do you get issues like this to compete? And they say, well we just have to build a place. And it's not viable for us to make lots of walkways. Um, we, we, I know you've got stuff to say. Chris, do you want to start this? Or you well, I mean, we're at diff very different stages and we will inherit the programme that's building upon uh, an or a direction that had, that had started. Um, we are, we're not starting from scratch, but it was very, very old school. Um, so number one is I needed a boss. That, so I sit on the congestion uh, board. So we're looking at how we're going to solve congestion. There will be a report out on that shortly. But we've got, uh, we've got health represented there. We've got me on that. That's not traditional. So that, that was really important. I think most important is what we have to make sure is, is Whenever these difficult questions, because cycling and walking, if seen in isolation, can be seen as not an essential. Because walking is just that thing that's invisible and everybody does it, so we don't need to think about it. Um, and it's, it, it's easy to just let it go if you look at it in isolation. But my job is to make sure that sitting snug up against that every time that we look at it is the question that's never asked is, and what does it cost us if we don't? And can we afford that? And we've monetized that and we know what it costs and it's billions a year and so right okay so if we do that then that adds to that bill can we afford that and it's making sure that unasked question is asked uh, and the right people are at the table to do that thanks i think also specifically you'll hear that you know the viability question all the time our ssr network does include the private sector as well and developers will say "Ooh, we can't build without any parking you guys are saying no parking and parking tends to be the replacement is either pedestrian or parking. I mean, Will, how do you counter arguments like that, that either pedestrian walkways are just not a priority because it's, we have to build housing, or we need parking, we don't need more walking? I don't buy the argument that they have to compete with each other. I, I really don't. I think the way that we build our city, we, 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 we have to be looking at how we retrofit this in an ancient city. As, as Keith said, these are, you know, we've got medieval streets going on, but we've also got new development. We're building, you know, we need to be building more homes. We need to be finding more, uh, more, more uh, affordable homes for people across, across the city. But we need to do that in a way that we are building for the future. We don't want to be retrospectively fitting all of this infrastructure into the new stuff. 
And so I, I strongly believe that as we get denser housing and, and those things, it will bring huge advantages to the active travel agenda because people will be able to walk and cycle more. What I'm delighted about is that the healthy streets approach that we've been taking in transport is now embedded in the London plan, which is essentially the planning framework for London, which is about, if you, you can call it out, it's the first time where you are, where you've got that healthy transport stuff being embedded in a, in a, in a planning, in the planning uh, regulations, as well as within the environment strategy, in the health inequalities aspect. This needs to expand the whole aspects of the sort of the government system. This is not just a transport policy. It's wrong to be thinking about it as just transport. It has to be embedded across all the different policies so that this becomes the new normal. We, this shouldn't be exceptional. This shouldn't be, the, we should be designing this into, into, into everyday lives. And we have to be doing that in the future developments as well as things. So we will not be uh, allowing buildings, new buildings in, in London with, with, with excessive car parking spaces. You should see that, you know, what we've got in the London plan. I'd encourage you to have a look at it. It's got specifications for not just the number of car parking spaces, but the number of bike parking spaces for all the different things. So if you build a school, there's a ratio between the number of pupils and the number of staff and the number of bike parking facilities that are there. The same, ditto with office buildings, ditto with residential buildings. So that, you know, as we put in the new buildings, we've got an approach that makes so that from planning regulation, you have to do this. The challenge is that we need to retrofit this into other areas as well, particularly around housing. So with office building and those sort of things, we can do stuff where they're often getting um, re, re, you know, fixed up and, 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 and repaired. The, the issue is the housing stock and particularly people living in flats and how do we provide the, uh, the cycling and, and the walking infrastructure in those communities. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, I think there was a question that actually came through Twitter about uh, well, review schemes in the pipeline that kind of comes back to that same thing and there's that question of how much weight does a review from your office have and I mean now the London plan really really helps because it's not just you arguing or these campaigners arguing it's the London plan it's the mayor and saying we will not fund anything on our land that does not meet these <coughs> these uh, requirements so there, there's some good work being done there um, Go ahead. So, and one of the things that is happening with so obviously transport schemes take an inordinate amount of time to, to get off the ground. I think everybody in the in the room can sort of groan at how long some of these things take. You know, I was talking to someone about Oxford Street and they said, Oh, I was working on this thirty years ago. Thirty years to get something done. It, it's 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 my mind. But we've got the momentum. But some of those schemes that are in the pipeline oh, are not Oh god. <laughs> yeah. Those schemes that are in the pipeline need to be reviewed in light of the current plans. We can't just be thinking about the ones going forward. So we are in the process of reviewing them. You know, I was looking at plans for a scheme the other day, but the first time I looked at them, I was like, this does not adhere to the mayor's transport policy. Let's go back and relook at it. How can we look at uh, continuous crossings for pedestrians in spaces? Putting in smaller parklets where you can block off roads. How do you put in more modal filters in there? And going back and getting people to review that. And uh, the, we've got the healthy streets checker that Brian's worked on, that Lucy, I think, is talking later on, and a lot of people have contributed into this room. So we can review the schemes that are in the pipeline and making sure that they are delivering the policies to the best the best they can, even though they might have been hatched up, hopefully not 30 years ago, but certainly over the past sort of decade. Thanks. Um, obviously, walking touches on many, many things. We're doing work on, on placemaking, on aging cities, which is going to be huge. It's going to be uh, a rise of 48% of London's population in the over 60s by 2035, a rise of 70% in the over 80s group, walking and walking for mobility, easy walking, getting around perhaps with other things is, is, is going to be quite key to them. Um, that speaks to one thing, though, of broadening this group, very passionate group, your supporters, I heard you have 80,000 supporters or something like that, um, for Living Streets and the walking movement. How are you going to go beyond this group and reach people who are a broader part of society who can get behind you, whether or not they're active campaigners? What are your plans to, to add and diversify your base? Well, I'm at, I'm at the nice position of having a building plans and I'm still in the honeymoon period so it's uh, it's 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 I'm in a, an easier position than, than you are but I think not must take you back to those two standards that are that people can understand so that's like the, the foundation or the top I don't know which which way you want to put it but um, must must be able to push a double buggy and want to be able to put, uh, want to push 
a double buggy, take my children to this place. And as soon as you agree that that's what we're going to do, then you go, well, what does that look like to you? And you can bet your bottom dollar everybody will agree that, well, actually, there's things to do, there's place to sit, there's night, it's, it's, it's got greenery, it's just a pleasant experience, it's away from the traffic. And you, your standards just fall out of that one sentence. But more importantly, the people on the street get that. People can get, can, I mean, I've used the phrase before, look out the car window when they're taking the kids to school. We've got 250 million car journeys a year of less than a kilometre, which is just ob obscene. Um, and a lot of those people don't want to do it, but can't get out of the cycle. Um, so they've got to look out and go, oh, I quite fancy that. And it's, it, it is as sim simplistic and complicated as that. These are the standards that it has to be, because that's also scarily measurable that you say, right, well, if it's not this, we're not going to build it. And, and that's what I'm in the process of pushing for right now, standards that say, listen, we've got, a, we've got a MERS challenge fund about to come on stream, and we will only fund things that meet this standard. You know, you can put in, if you want to carry on doing it your own way in your district, great, but we will only fund you if you do it to this standard. And that's our lever. We've got um, council leaders that want to do it. There's 10 of them, and Andy's effectively the chair of the board and he has the transport portfolio, and they want to do it. So it's just agreeing those standards away from the heat of battle and then making sure that we stick to them. Well, what about you? I think there were... Somebody earlier was talking about the silent minority. Um, oh, sorry, the silent majority. There's a very vocal minority that tends to dominate the debate, and there is a sort of pyramid of people who are so active in terms of campaigning and, and, and are really prominent and help lead the field. And, and, and I think this room is sort of, it contains uh, a, a, that, 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 pinnacle, that pinnacle group. But there are so many other people who believe in this agenda. They might not necessarily be carrying the placards or campaigning, but they're out there and they want to see those changes for their kids, for their neighborhoods. They know the benefits on that. And I think it's, it's a way that we engage and talk to that broader group is absolutely essential. In a, in the, and the language we use that's about improving people's lives, improving people's neighborhoods, rather than being talking about this is a transport thing, that this is how we get people to move through your area or through your neighborhood. What we're doing is enhancing it for people who live, live in this space. And the way you change that conversation is, is really interesting. So we've got good examples in London and uh, the work that's been going on in Waltham Forest in, uh, uh, with, uh, with some of the schemes there, it's been very interesting to see how their approach to consulting communities has changed and they've learned from this. From rather than sort of coming in saying, this is, you know, what do you think of this? Yeah. And, and this is what we thought of, which I think TFL can be guilty of at, at times, uh, quite often, and saying, this is what we're doing, what do you think? Actually, what are the issues facing your community? And often it's around air pollution, often it's around road safety or speed of traffic and people not wanting their kids to play out on the road or, or, or that thing. And then coming up jointly with a solution, working much closely with communities where these challenges are happening. And the sad fact is that there is an equalities agenda sitting behind so much of this. Poorer communities, uh, disadvantaged communities, get the worst deal out of all of this in terms of air pollution, in terms of the road safety, in terms of the, the, the challenges. So we need to be engaging a much wider audience to actually drive this change because fairness has to sit at the heart of our city's transport strategy. Thank you. We're going to go to questions in a minute from the audience. Just to round that up, um, it's your last day on the job as commissioner. What one thing would you be proudest of having in an ideal world? Is it is it masses of double buggies? <laughs> what, Chris, what's what's your oh. now? You knew this question was coming, so Will, I can oh, start with oh. you if you want. But yeah, uh, start with him. Start yeah, with him. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, actually, uh, Keith flagged up something earlier when he was talking about the gyratory removal and the, pu and the public square being on four lanes, what used to be four lanes of traffic. Mm. I would be like to be sitting, having a cup of coffee, and I can Ooh. think exactly on which four lanes of traffic I would like to take out. But I want to be sitting in those four lanes of traffic uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice space that is welcoming for people and people not to be going, <coughs> oh, wow, isn't this incredible? Yeah, I would like people to be saying, this is normal. This is how it should be. This is how our city should be operating. And uh, yeah, so I suppose that's, I, I do not want this to be exceptional. I would love to be able to get to the point where it might not be in all, it, it, the, the schemes might have not rolled out across London, but the principle of actually taking four lanes of traffic in and putting in a public space which people can use 
to become normal. That's what people would want in their neighbourhoods. Um, there's a great example in, in Archway, where there's been a, a removal of a gyratory there. Um, there was a, well, while the work was still going on, where there had been, I think it wasn't four lanes, because it might have been three lanes of traffic, but a, a community came out and had a Good Friday church service, impromptu, yeah, just where these three lanes of traffic had been. And if people are doing that on a regular basis, then I think that's a sign of progress. Good. Thanks. Chris? I, I, think, it w I think it's going to be 10 years when that happens. Um, at least that's, that's what it should be. And I think that's as fast as we can do it. But when I walk away... He's just I'm, committed to being commissioner for 10 years. You heard him here first. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't think that through. <laughs> I'll start again. In two years' time. Um, I, I'd like to be able to walk away and we stop. I mean, particularly for that side of my job, we, we no longer talk about cyclists. We've actually made the term redundant. Uh, just walking, getting around cities, normal people, normal clothes, doing normal things without cars. It's just how we do it. And we don't have... Uh, we, we, we've identified we need 1.5 billion to do this. We don't have, a, after 10 years, a cycling budget. It's just how we do streets. And we hope that by that time we have created such an example over such an area <coughs> that it is an example that is unignorable by the government of the day and the rest of the country follows suit. So that's what I'd like when I walk away. In two to ten years, yeah. somewhere yeah. in there, somewhere Six in there. Months. Thank you both. Um, we'll do what we did before. We'll take questions in groups of three. Can I get hands up, please? Who would like to ask? And, and get. Ooh, let's get. You're coming from the back, so let's get the lady in green. We'll go that side first. Lady in green, and then these two, and then we'll come to this side. So, and then there's two people up here as well who have questions. They'll come next. So, can you say um, who you are, where you're from, and phrase it as a question? Um, I'm Rosalind Redhead. I'm chair of Campaign for Better Transport London. Um, I did a Freedom for Inform of Information request um, last year um, about the congestion charge and I wanted 24-7 information which wasn't available before and it showed at 6 o'clock when the congestion charge finishes there is an absolute surge in cars coming into central London. Now in terms of people going home from work that means a wave of air pollution, a wave of congestion, people stuck at pedestrian crossings as, you know, people, um, as, as uh, motor vehicles are prioritised, flow of traffic. Now, how difficult, how difficult would it be for Transport for London to extend those congestion charge hours, which only cover a third of the week, to really make these streets less congested and polluted? Would you be after 24-7 or would you have just longer? I would like 24-7. Yeah, okay, that's the goal. Okay, and then we had two over here. Uh. Simon Monk, uh, London Cycling Campaign. Um, I wanted to ask, CS, CS9 out towards Hounslow um, is a really good example of this. There is a real tension uh, between walking, cycling, buses uh, and motor car congestion that I think TfL is really struggling with at the moment. Um, so I really wanted to hear thoughts about kind of how we start to tackle that issue of saying there's just not enough space um, and, and TfL modelling comes back and says, well, we, we can't get rid of all the motor cars all as quick as we want to. Um, then the buses guys say, we can't get rid of the buses. Uh, then it's kind of a fight for space, for the remaining space left. So uh, just how we, we see that changing in the next few years. Okay, thank you. Third question. <coughs> Um, yeah, similar vein. Um, uh, Will, Will Norman, you rightly said that safety is paramount here. I mean, as a regular walker in central London, one of the biggest threats to my safety is from the minority of cyclists, unfortunately, who seem to think that the rules about uh, pedestrian crossings and traffic lights and the highway code in general um, don't apply to them. Uh, what's being done to sort of clamp down on that sort of behaviour and also to update the fact that when recently there was a fatality caused by reckless cycling, we had to rely on an obscure Victorian law to sort of try and bring any kind of justice here. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, three questions, very pointed. Uh, so the question about 24-7 um, congestion charge or somewhere on the spectrum towards that. So I remember the day the congestion charge came in. I used to catch the 38 bus to into central London and the 38 bus at the time was one of the buses you could jump off the back of uh, because the back was open, the old route masters. 
And uh, when, before the congestion charge came in, I could always get off exactly where I wanted to, to get into uh, where I was working. Uh, and um, the day the congestion charge came in, I had to, the bus didn't stop. It wasn't stopping where I wanted to get off. It, was, it carried on for another 250 odd meters and stopped at the bus stop. And you could see instantly how that congestion charge had actually relieved, uh, relieved uh, 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 reduced congestion in, in central London. Um, but that was a long time ago. Uh, and I personally believe that we need to be looking at what is we what you know what would a a, a new system look like in terms of uh, the, the the charging the the information Rosalind that you looked at in terms of the, the congestion increasing after six o'clock. Actually, if you ever look in the mayor's transport strategy, that's it's detailed in there actually where the congestion you know congestion comes up and then it begins to increase a bit. So we we've, we've published that and uh, and and it and it's out there. I, within the mayor's transport strategy, there is an approach to looking at how do we look again at user charging for, 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 for not just central London, but do we look at that more broadly and, uh, and, and looking at that so that it is fairer and I think reviewing the hours and the types of vehicles that would, um, that would be included in that. At the moment, uh, taxis and private hire vehicles are not included in, in, that, in, in that strategy. Should that be the case? So that is work that's ongoing because I personally believe that the uh, congestion charge that worked very well however many years ago, goodness, what is it? How many years ago? I can't remember. 15 years ago. Um, I, 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 don't think it's, uh, I, I don't think it's working as well as it should be for the city, and I think it is something that we need to be looking at again. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if you heard me make a sort of growling noise when it said private hire vehicles because I have a thing about Ubers. But anyway, just the quantity of them I think they're useful. Um, because most of these come to, uh, to Will, um, actually Chris... The, the we're in London. Though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I think the question them. about the tension between uh, the different mode uses on the street kind of applies to both cities and perhaps Manchester more because you're, you're, you're not quite as far along on the path. So between you, just in terms of cities, um, what do you think the potential is? Uh, so that was the sort of legal question at, uh, at the end there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we're probably in this room more than any other. We're, we're aware of the stats. So we've got what 400 plus uh, pedestrians killed by motor vehicles each year. 40 of them on the pavement, um, and the death by cycling is between one and two. So vision zero, uh, definitely the way to go. You don't want one or two. Um, I think what's important is we first of all we, we focus on. Um, the behaviour. So what we're down to with cyclists, in large part, is antisocial behaviour. And it is, uh, it is intimidating, it, it's rude. And we should, rather than saying cyclists this, motorists this, because we've all seen it, you end up in this spiral of, yeah, well, I've seen a car on a red light and you know, so on. Just look at, right, these behaviours are not acceptable. And we should, make, we should target everybody who is behaving in this way, particularly those that threaten pedestrians. Um, where we can't enforce it equally, we should start with those that can do the most harm and work backwards. But that's not to say that antisocial behaviour is not uh, something to be targeted. I'm alarmed by the level of policing at the moment. Um, I'm still trying to get some stats, actually. I'm very interested in what happened. Operation Safeway, wasn't it? About three years ago now, so three or four years ago. Um, and we, there was, it was noted that regular crime dropped. So just the presence of police regularly actually made crime go down and other people were caught. So that level of policing enhanced society. What I wanted to know, I wanted that monetized. I actually wanted to see what was the net saving for having those police versus the cost of the police. And I think that would certainly help me um, because you can't just ask the police to do more and more and more. We have to sort of try and solve the problem. But if we can show there's a saving from having them, I very much want to explore that. This question has come up in other uh, sessions too, where um, one of the things that happened in my hometown of Montreal, which is huge for jaywalking because it's just easier and safer than crossing at the light, was uh, ticketing people. Whoever they caught, they would just, it became known that you would get an $80 fine for jaywalking and people just kind of stopped doing it. So if you could pick a few and just sort of ticket anyone you could catch mm. and get them, there'd be that mess there going, ooh, I'm going to get ticketed, that kind of thing. Will. So thanks, thank, I think, thanks for the question, and I, I'm really glad that you did say it was the minority of cyclists who are, who are, uh, who are doing this. And, and most people in, who cycle in London are, are, are careful and considerate. Uh, but 
the risk of um, the risk of death or serious injury from a cyclist, as Chris said, is, is relatively low. I think in 2015 in London, 230 odd people were were involved in a collision uh, from from a cycling. That's compared with 5,146 <laughs> uh, who were involved in a collision with a motor vehicle. Yeah. So um, while. As Chris said, no death and no injury is acceptable or tolerable. We do need to focus on the, uh, the, the, the biggest, the, one of the biggest challenges on that. Which that brings said, back to that we, question, yeah. People should not be cycling on pavements. People should not be cycling through red lights. That is, that is against the law. It is against the highway code. And we do have a team that enforces that. So I know last year, over 2,500 tickets were giving out to cyclists who are, were, were, were breaking the law. So there is enforcement activity on, on doing that, I think we need to continue to do to, to, to do that, giving uh, and, and make sure that that message is very clear that we are supporting considerate and careful cycling in the city. We need to be building the safer infrastructure that allows people to to feel safe on the roads. Quite often, cyclists are cycling on the pavement because they don't feel safe on on the roads. If we can make people feel safe on the roads, then the evidence shows that people are more <coughs> considerate and, and there's less of that conflict. Um, but I would say that we. We, we need to make sure that uh, that those people who are breaking the law, uh, that law is enforced and, and has a big impact. But I am also very keen on making sure that the, uh, the, the we are looking at where the areas of greatest risk for, for fatalities and serious injury are, which clearly lies with, uh, with, 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 the, with the trucks and cars. Well, hence also that question about the CS9 coming through. But I'm going to take three over here because we're running out of time. We've done this side of the room. Three questions on this side, please. We have uh, two hands in the back and then one up here. You, you guys, pick. you have the microphones. Gentlemen, and, and I saw that hand on the right there go up as well, and then up here. So what's your question, please? Um, James Avery from Coventry. Uh, unfortunately, we had a, um, a fatality uh, where two young kids were knocked down two weeks ago. Um, and uh, what I want to know is, what's going to happen about 20 MPH limits? Uh, Coventry actually did something progressive five years ago. Uh, we committed to 20 MPH limits. Um, on the very street where this incident happened, uh, we were told a year ago by a petition that because we haven't collected the six deaths or the six KSIs, yeah. no action can take place. Yet we have the law, in the, we have the approval of the 20 MPH limits, which could have just been applied uh, instead of using the uh, collect the six approach. Okay, thanks. So we're going to move quickly because we've got uh, just a little time. So that next question, then if you can bring the mic up here for this lady in green. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm impressed. As we saw on our walk down from the tube, the existing infrastructure is not fit for purpose, actually. The number of drop crossings there were no tactile paving of the wrong colour. Sorry, I can't hear you. There was no tactile paving or it was the wrong colour. Okay. In respect of London, can I ask that there's a review of all pedestrian crossings, which will include looking at tactile paving, that they should allow so they should delete the current standard of actually not allowing tactile paving at refuges because that's based on the design money for roads and bridges, which is for trunk roads and motorways. Okay, thank you very much. And the last question here. Um, yeah. I'm Lily, I'm an urban design and city planning student at UCL. Uh, I was wondering uh, if uh, smart uh, streets are part of uh, your agenda. Smarter streets. Yeah, okay. smart streets. Thank you. Okay, so the three questions about, and I know we're running out of time, I'm watching. I'm afraid of Terence now. Um, 20 mile per hour limits, anything that you've done to sort of advance that agenda? I love it. I'm really interested in 20 mile an hour zones because the ripple effects from that, um, from that measure, if it works, We've got a big chunk of uh, Greater Manchester now has bring, brought them in and they've been really badly adhered to, uh, so it's not working. Putting the sign up, however, putting the sign up is the first step. Uh, I think what I need to know, and I'm very early days on this, because the difference between, yes, go on, you can walk to school, with cars doing 40 miles an outside, actually I'll run you there. Uh, and this huge difference, this subtle thing makes, it ripples out. Um, so it's really important, but we need to be able to enforce it properly and enforce it in a way that we can afford to do. So I'm very interested to explore how we can actually get funds actually coming back and not just back into our region, but into that area and possibly even that street, which people go, okay, I'm okay with heavy enforcement here because this is about me and I'm benefiting. So I'm really interested in 20 mile an hour zone. 
Thanks. I'm going to actually switch over to you and ask you, is anything being done about pavements? So uh, we are currently reviewing pedestrian crossings uh, across, across London, and that, a lot of that's focusing on, on the timings of pedestrian crossings, but as part of the guidance around the pedestrian uh, designs and the, and the infrastructure that goes on to the streets, um, I'm, uh, I will make sure that we're looking at the tactile uh, paving crossing. So thank you for that question. On smarter streets, definitely. Uh, in terms of how we are um, using technology in a, in, a, in a better way, both in terms of using technology to manage traffic and to manage pedestrian flows, new, way, new and innovative ways of, um, of, of, of working with the, 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 the navigation and engaging with people with, uh, with, with things around them, the, the Internet of Things. We look, we, we, we've got a team looking at innovation within, within our city streets. Um, I have to admit that I'm a little bit of a Luddite and I don't know all the detail on that, but I'd be really happy to follow up if you need to. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to both of you. It's been fascinating. I think they're around for a while, so all the questions I'm sorry we didn't get to, come and find them. You can corner them over lunch. But, uh, thank you so much anyway. Oh, good. Thanks very much.